Let's talk about impulse. I have an old joke right here. This is from uh, Star Trek The Next Generation, which is super old, so I'm sure you haven't seen it, but there we go. It's funny, at least to me. So we've got the definition of something called impulse. Now, impulse is a change in momentum. That's really important for you to know this. You could be asked this on an exam. So what is this thing called impulse? Let's look at, we have an equation in your data booklet. It goes like this, J equals F times delta T. So that's the equation for it. This is in your data booklet, so you don't have to memorize it. So let's start defining some of the variables then. So F is going to be the average resultant force, and that's in Newtons. We've got delta T, that's the change in time in seconds. And then we've got this thing now, this new quantity called J, which is the impulse. Now, uh, impulse on its own doesn't really help you so much. It's what you do with it. So, for example, this F delta T, that's going to be important. Also, this idea of change in momentum I'll talk about in a second. What are the units of impulse? Well, if you look at the equation, it goes F times delta T. Well, F has units of newtons. Delta T has units of seconds. So if they're multiplied, it must be newton seconds. So newtons times seconds. I'll just get rid of that. There we go. Newtons seconds. Okay, so what else do we need? Well, there's a really important piece that we do need. We need to know this extra piece right here that it equals delta P. This piece right here, I want you to memorize this. I want you to know this. Because in my mind, I don't just see, how this, I kind of just skip this whole J thing. I just say F delta T equals delta P. That is the most important thing to, to really work with here. So I much prefer, for example, just saying F delta T equals delta P. Because impulse by itself doesn't do much, but this does. Force times change in time equals change in momentum. That's really useful. So that, I think, is, is a good way to go with it. So here's just a, a little exam trick here. That what, if you do, what do you do if you're given some kind of graph? Now, you don't know what this is. This here could be some quantity y with units of y, whatever that is. It could be like force in newtons. And you have some quantity x with units of x. I just put units in the little square brackets just to help here. And the question is like, all right, what if it's a paper 1a kind of question where, you know, it's multiple choice. You don't know what to do, or it's even paper 2 where you just, you're lost. You don't know what to do with this graph. Well, there's only three things you could actually be doing with the graph. That's the good news. So step one. You could just read a value directly from the graph. Now, do you think that's really going to happen on an exam? It won't. So if you're thinking that's going to be that easy, like, hey, here's x, what's y? It's not that easy. So it's probably not going to be that. So then there's two other things you could do. So if you remember from uh, math class, uh, calculus, for example, there's two calculus things you can do with the graph. You can take the gradient of a graph. Now, gradient, that's going to be... Um, these things over these things. So in other words, it's going to have units of, um, well, it's going to be y over x, and it's going to have units of y over the units of x. And sometimes that'll help. So take a look, for example, at equations that you know or something like that and think, would this thing divided by this thing help me? Does that relate to an equation? And if it doesn't, then think about the third thing you can do, which is the area under the curve. And if you did that, what does that have units of? That has area has units of like, you know, these things times these things. It's like, you know, length times width or something like that. So that means area under the graph will have units of, well, it'll be like x, y, and it'll have units of x times units of y. And maybe that'll help you. So that's just a little exam tip there. I think that's kind of helpful, at least if you're really lost. Just try the gradient, try the area under the curve, see if one of them helps you. Hint, hint. One of them is going to help you here. So let's look at this. Let's use what we just learned above. So we've got a graph of force versus time. This is quite typical. Something like this. And then you, you're sort of wondering, well, what can I do with this? Well, that's how we're going to use this equation then. So I'm going to just use uh, F delta T. And I'm going to say that equals delta P. That's the change in momentum. And the reason why that's going to be helpful then is, well, let's take a look at this and see what we can do with it. Right? So if we look at this right here, okay, we've got F delta T equals delta P. So I'm going to start, I'm going to sort of play around with this equation. First of all, do you remember Newton's second law? Newton's second law, the version that goes like this, F equals delta P delta T. That's just this. Look, if I started with F and I just wanted to go delta P delta T, that's Newton's second law already. So that's kind of nice. 
Now, how is this helpful for a graph? Well, let's just look at f delta t equals delta p. If I don't know what to do with a graph, remember, I try to read a value directly. All right, that doesn't help. What could I do with it? I could also take a gradient. So in other words, f over t, that's not really relating to these things. But if I take the area under the curve, let's just look at this. So the area under the curve, what does that give me? Well, that's going to give me um, well f times t. Do you notice? And that does not look like the momentum. So that means the area under the curve, which is going to give me this, will tell me the change in momentum. So in other words, then if I do this, I hear the area under the curve. Maybe I'll make it more clear here. The area under the curve tells me the change in momentum. So that's actually really useful. This is actually a very useful thing on exams. This shows up quite a bit on exams where you don't really know what to do with it. Like, how do I use this? Because what could you do with momentum? Pfft. Maybe they ask you for like the mass of something or the speed of something from a graph like this. You think, how can I do that? Well, the area under this graph is equal to delta, t, uh, delta p. And because of that, then you can use that to do stuff. You can use that to find either m or maybe you can find v. It depends, right? But basically, if you're looking for something that's related to momentum and you have this weird graph of f versus t, think about impulse. That's the key here, okay? So let's look at an example. We're given that we have a bullet with a mass of 647 grams. Watch out, before I do anything else, I'm going to say then that that is 0 0.647 kilograms. That's going to be important. And it's initially at rest. Ooh, that means the initial speed is zero. Okay, good. Um, and then it's fired from a rifle. Now we're told that the graph shows the force versus time on the bullet. Uh, while it's in the rifle. And notice a few things first. I want you to just be really, really careful. Always look at the units here. Look at these. These are kilonewtons. In other words, times 10 to the 3. And this right here, look at this. We've got times 10 to the minus 2 seconds. That's really important here. So first, how are we going to deal with this? Well, we can look at this whole idea. Remember that uh, J, the impulse, equals f delta t. That's the part from your uh, data booklet. But hopefully you add the extra piece equals delta p. Now why is that going to be helpful? Again, remember, because we're just going to build this together here. So that means that the area, remember f times delta t, that's the area under this graph here. So I can say that the area under the graph, what does that equal? That's going to equal delta p. In other words, it's going to equal, since the mass stays the same, it's going to be m delta v. That's what it's going to equal. So I just got to find the area under the graph. Well, the area of a triangle, let's see, it's a base times height divided by 2. So in this case right here, it's going to be, let's see, base, which is 1 times 10 to the minus 2. Okay, So that means it's going to be 0 0.01. Um, all that times uh, 136,000, there we go, all that divided by 2. And why is that? Because this is a triangle. And that's going to equal m delta v. And therefore, can you see I can just uh, then get v by itself then? Because keep in mind, delta v is going to be the change in velocity, but it started off with at rest. So that means then the final speed then will be uh, this. I mean, we can just find delta V. We'll just do that like this. So that means delta V is going to equal, let's see, it's going to be all this stuff over here divided by the mass. So I'll just write it all out again. So it's 0 0.01 times 136,000. Divide that by 2 and divide that by the mass, which is 0 0.647. Let me just do that on my calculator, and then I'll get the answer, hopefully. So I need a new calculator, there we go. And I'm going to do, so 0 0.01. Oh, I'll do, actually, I'll do a, um, I'll do a nice pretty fraction, I think, instead. So I'll go like this and say, okay, I want 0 0.01 times 136,000. And divide that by 2 times 0 0.647. I end up with an answer of 1051. Now that's going to be in meters per second. And like I said, this is delta V. But it started at rest, remember? So that means the final speed then, when it leaves the rifle, will just be this same number here. Now let's do it to, uh, let's see, three significant figures, three significant figures, three of them. So I'll leave it with three. So I'll say 105, and then I'll just make that one a zero then. So we'll say it's approximately 
this. This will be my speed, my final speed in the rifle. Like that's its final speed right as it's exiting the rifle. And that's 1050. So 1050 meters per second is how fast it goes right when it leaves.